Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Food Focus's very, very first webinar. Um, I'm Linda Jackson. I'm one of the founders of Food Focus, and with me in the background are my colleagues Bridget Day and uh, Del Kroch, who's listening in from Paris. Um, we're delighted to have you this morning, and we know that this is going to be the first of many of this kind of interaction. We're so excited to be able to have a face-to-face -face interaction, so to speak, um, and we're looking forward to your questions and looking forward to many more webinars where we talk about things that you, you're specifically interested in. Um, today, I want to talk about legal matters, and uh, this is our, our legal eagle slot. And uh, joining me will be our um, colleague and friend, Janusz Luterek from Hahn and Hahn. We just think that uh, he's the ideal person to talk us through some of the issues uh, regarding supplier agreements and uh, liability issues between yourselves and the retailers. Um, and so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Janusz. Um, Janusz holds degrees in both chemical engineering and in law. He's a registered attorney, a patent attorney, and a professional engineer. He joined uh, Hahn and Hahn as a partner in uh, 1997. And this uh, boutique law firm specializes in technology law and in intellectual property law. He's a custodian member of uh, SAFOST, and he also sits on the council of the FSI of the Consumer Goods Council. And he actively participates in the Food Legislation Advisory Group to the Department of Health. He's assisted many listed companies, um, as well as Safost, with their various foodstuffs and Cosmetics and Disinfectant Act and the regulations, the submissions that they've made to the Departments of Health and the Department of Agriculture. And uh, he's also been extensively involved in the GMO debate and the issue of advertising to children. So that's why we think he's the perfect person to talk to us today. So welcome, Janusz. I'm going to share the screen with you and welcome you on stage. Welcome, Janusz. Good morning. Hi, Janusz. How are you? All right, how are you, Linda? That's great. Thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> Janusz, um, we settle in for a morning's discussion on liability issues and uh, the supplier agreements with the retailers and uh, suppliers. Um, I've, uh, I've always been a little bit concerned that the suppliers to retail are signing contracts that they don't necessarily appreciate the gravity of, um, or they don't have a contract with their, uh, with their customers and are so therefore exposed when it comes to any indemnity issues or any liability issues. So I just wanted to get sort of some, some input from you with regards to how should a supplier approach a contract between themselves and the retailers and what should they be looking out for um, in this contract? Yes. Uh, now this is a very important topic. I'm approached all the time by companies present me with a, a supplier agreement that they've been given and they are told simply if you want to keep supplying us please sign this and return it by a certain date yeah what is quite amusing is that quite often they've been supplying for years already without such an agreement absolutely and continue supplying while the agreement is still not signed and is waiting to be signed but yes to be that as it may the agreements are normally quite voluminous complicated and would create liability for a party which they're not even aware of. Yeah. This type of agreement is often then given to a buyer or some marketing person, and they are then told, let's get this signed and return it to us. And they don't really understand the importance and the effect of having signed such an agreement. Absolutely. It's also common within a supply chain. It's not always only between the supplier and the retailer. But you'll find a supplier will go to their ingredient suppliers and want them to sign similar agreements. Yes. yes. Sometimes these agreements require that the person who signs it accepts liability for the entire supply chain, regardless whose fault it is. Absolutely. And obviously, this is a big problem, and uh, it's quite important, I think, that industry understand, first of all, that the agreement should be carefully reviewed before they are signed, and secondly, that everybody understands Whose responsibility is which part of the supply chain? Mm. I'm also a bit concerned, Janusz, that uh, we have 
um, technical people are asked to complete supplier questionnaires. Um, so you have the 16 page document, which is based on the R146 Annex. And within that document, you actually have an indemnity clause included as part of the supplier specification. So over and above any contract which may exist and may be signed between the salesperson of the company and the, and the, the customer, you also have these documents floating around. And as you say, they're going right down the supply chain. And, and I'm just a little bit concerned that these are also being seen as addendums to a contract. Well, I will first tell you that my standard standing advice to all my clients is simply delete those clauses in Annexure 6 of R146. The Department of Health has no place to be prescribing who is liable for which event in the supply chain. They are there to deal with health issues, with uh, labeling requirements, which preservatives can be used. They certainly aren't there to dictate who is going to be liable for what. So Absolutely. as a starter, simply delete those clauses. Okay. But if yes. you have signed them, there could well be a difficulty, and one would have to look at the sequence of events because when a new supply contract is signed, it presumably supersedes the previous one. Yes. So if, the, if that Annex 6 type document was signed and then later a supplier agreement was signed, it may in fact supersede it. Yes. So that will depend to some extent on the wording of the second document. Absolutely. A second but I, document which often arises is people get presented with a so called CTA indemnity. Yes. It's often just a one pager whereby they accept all liability of any risk and any claim which may arise under the CTA. And is that, uh, is that legal? Uh, I mean, is, is that allowed? Well, in South Africa, we have freedom of contract. And you can agree to anything unless you're a consumer, because the Consumer Protection Act does have certain protections for consumers uh, where completely one-sided and unfair agreements are simply not allowed. Yes. But as between big players in a supply chain, there's unfettered freedom into, into any type of contract. And if you agree to accept the liability, you've agreed to accept the liability. So, so there's definitely truth to reading the fine print, because if you don't read the fine print, then what you're saying is you've, you've agreed to it, and so therefore you are liable for it. Sure, but quite often this isn't even in the fine print. It's actually in 12-point aerial. And they say, well, I need to supply, so therefore I sign. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I think there's, the, there's also in terms of the, you know, the, disc, the debate is, is that fair or is that reasonable to expect, you know, someone to sign such a one-sided agreement? Well, our legal system isn't based on fairness, it's based on law. So although it is unfair, and if you want to have an equitable supply chain and a relationship with your suppliers, you should actually have an agreement where each party takes responsibility for their own actions or omissions. But the reality is, of course, that the lawyers in the, in the big companies each want to protect the company maximum sure. possible. Sure. Uh, and that is why we read the way the big guy in fact carry the liability regardless what happens. So there's, there's always got to be somebody who's the full guy. Um, we've got to be able to blame, blame someone at the end of the day. For companies involved, there's an ingredient supplier who's supplying to a manufacturer, who supplies to a distributor, who supplies to a retailer. There are numerous such agreements, each one purporting to put the liability on the other. Such a there's all these contracts in between, each one blaming, each one putting the blame on the other guy. Absolutely. Janusz, before we go on, we've lost you. Um, we've lost your picture. Oh. Um, I can see you. I can still hear you. I can see you clearly, and my, my picture seems to be fine. Can you not see me anymore? Never mind, let's move on to the slides. Um, I know you've got some slides that you wanted to share with us. I'm just going to put on the application sharing. Okay, it's coming up now, do you see it? I see them, thank you, Janusz. Got it. 
Yes, okay. thank you, Yanni. Okay, so maybe you can take us through um, through your slides. Yeah, perfect. So I'm really focusing today on the supply agreements and the liability aspect thereof, rather than, as I said, all the commercial terms, yes. those things which people are generally aware of. Yes, absolutely. So a basic supply agreement stuff. And in South Africa, as I said, there's almost unfettered freedom to terms regardless how one-sided they may be. One will see this when you see agreements that would require a baker of pies to accept liability with a retailer who bakes the pies, has mishandled the pies, and someone has got poisoning, and now they want to hold yes. the manufacturer of the pie liable Whereas, in fact, at the time the fire was shipped, it was in perfect condition and right temperature. The problem being that once you sign such an agreement, you would be liable. Okay. Because you're becoming the insurer of the retailer. There are certain exceptions, and the Consumer Protection Act, the CPA, provides that an agreement with a consumer must be fair, just, and reasonable. This can be important if you're a very small supplier because any company with a turnover of less than 2 million rand per annum is in fact considered a consumer and is protected under the CPA. So okay. if you're a mom and pop cake baker and you're supplying a very big retail chain and they present you with such an agreement, that agreement may in fact be legal and not binding. Um, okay. You cannot exclude liability to a consumer for harm caused. Uh, but you certainly can between the contracting parties. So it's possible to say to a consumer, eat at own risk. Now, I've, I've actually had somebody ask me once, but can't they do that? And the answer is no. The Consumer Protection Act provides consumers with certain guarantees. But quite certainly between a big, let's say, egg supplier and a big bakery chain, uh, you can say that you are buying these eggs at your own risk and whatever happens, happens. You must test them first or whatever the case might be. Okay. Moving down it's see, it, it does seem a little... Sorry? Sorry, no, it, it does seem a little unfair when you have, um, you know, a product that is supplied in good faith and then it, you know, it, it, it is returned. Um, although when you handed it over, it was you know, in perfect, in perfect condition. So what you're saying is be careful what you sign for in that regard. Yes, because at the end of the day, the, the court will most likely say, look, you agreed, you should have put some, some procedures or steps in place to ensure that the product is, is still fine at the time that the consumer buys it. Now, what those steps are, of course, could be very complicated, but it's possible. I mean, I've discussed with some of my clients and there are steps one can put in place. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And of course, one always has a choice not to supply. So if sure. you find that the retailer you are selling to is engaging in risky business, then you may say, well, look, I have a reputation to protect. And as well as you are not trying to make me liable for your risky behavior, unfortunately, under these conditions, I won't be able to supply you. Sure, sure. I, I, if only it was so simple. <laughs> okay, so now you can Take us through some terms that we that we need to be aware of when it comes to the fine print. Yeah, sure. And you know, some words which on the surface don't seem that important have huge implications. So when you see in a contract it says the supplier shall indemnify the retailer, blah blah blah. Well, you need to understand that indemnifying means that you will pay all the liability, all the damages or losses of the party being indemnified. It's a blanket thing. You could be responsible for all the stock claims by consumers. Laboratory huge. Another one that comes up less often, but does come up from time to time, is this thing of an obligation to defend, which says that if there should be claims against the company, you need to pay for the legal defense of the company. Now, often that is bundled together, so to speak, with the indemnity clause. It says you will indemnify and you will have the obligation to defend. Although quite often what these contracts tend, tend to say is that you will be liable for the legal costs, but the company will decide which lawyers to use on its own. The, the problem with the obligation to defend is that if you are defending your own case, 
you may come to a point where you decide, I think it's time to settle. We should stop this case. But okay. when you are paying to defend somebody else's case, they say, look, let's see how far this goes. Maybe we get everything, maybe we don't, yes. but why stop now? We're not paying the legal bill. Sure. <laughs> oh my gosh, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. The, the issue about being reasonable doesn't come up. And bearing in mind that if you didn't win the case, they're indemnified anyway because you've given them an, an indemnity. Um, yes. An important thing that comes up in many contracts is this issue of a warranty. And often you'll find that there's a clause and it says the supplier warrants the following. And then it lists five or ten things which the supplier warrants. You want to be very careful because the normal level of, of uh, for liability in our law is that you shouldn't be negligent. You should, yes. you, should, you should be aware of things that are foreseeable and they may lead to damages and you would be liable for those. Once you've warranted yes. something, you become strictly liable. No negligence is required. It's simply, was that particular clause breached? Yes or no? And if the answer is yes, you are liable. It doesn't go into the, the sure. causation issue. So giving warranties just makes it so much simpler for the other party to come after you. Absolutely. Another clause which often... And, and, and here we are thinking that our food safety management systems are, are going to be all of the, the sort of, you know, practices that we have in place to prevent negligence or to minimize negligence. And what you're saying is that clause effectively wipes all of that out anyway. Yeah, yeah. If you give a warranty that the foodstuffs are at all times safe and won't cause harm, etc., well, then the issue of whether you had a food safety system or not becomes irrelevant because you have a 100% warranty, whereas normal food safety systems would be a percentage issue, would be statistical. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so fit for purpose. Yeah, so often people will say, oh, but uh, whatever you're supplying must be fit for purpose. If you're supplying me with flour, it must be fit for the, for, for the purpose for which I'm going to use it. But quite often what you find is that although it requires that the product supplies be fit for purpose, the purpose is not stated or it's stated so generically that there's no way you could have you could have given such a such a promise because you don't know what they're going to be using it for. They could basically use it for any purpose within the food industry. When the cake flops, so to speak, they then turn around and say, well, your flour wasn't fit for purpose. You say, well, I didn't know you were going to bake a cake. I thought you were going to make a biscuit. And that mm. also liability arises then for lost turnover, lost productivity, etc. Goodness, okay. A clause which comes up quite often within supply chains, especially where companies are running on absolutely minimum stock. They don't want to be holding any stock because obviously that's just in time. Up. Yeah. So they put into the contract that time is of the essence. And then they often have a penalty clause which says that if you don't supply within a certain time, a penalty starts running. Uh, once you've signed the time is of the essence clause, all your ability to plead inability, etc., with, with the exception of possibly flooding and act of God, are all excluded. The time is of the essence binds you in iron handcuffs to the timelines that you have promised. And all the problems which could arise become your problems, not the problems of the party that you are supplying. Goodness. And then, of course, there's penalty clauses for breach, which include breach of yes. things like time of delivery, but there are many other things that can be breached. And some that I've seen can be very onerous, where if you promise to deliver something and there's a 5,000 rand a day penalty, and you're two weeks late, the penalty could exceed the value of the goods that you were going to supply, or certainly the margin on the goods that you were going to supply. So you actually end up supplying the product essentially for free. For free because of the because of the penalty clause. The penalty clause. Okay, so those are very. Sorry. I'm just thinking. So those are very, the very very important clauses that we need to that we need to consider. 
I think I'm, we're now talking about a, 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 an agreement between the supplier and um, uh, the retailer, but what about agreements between suppliers and suppliers? Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that you would need to consider this all the way down the supply chain. Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially clauses such as the fit for purpose, you know, where a pie manufacturer is getting ingredients from different companies in order to make the pies or uh, any manufacturer, for that matter of fact, where they are running on a, on a minimum sort of stock holding and they rely on all the ingredients arriving. Now, one doesn't arrive. So they can't produce anything and the time is of the essence yes. clause and a penalty clause, for example. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So you, in terms of your suppliers, if I'm supplying ingredients, the next slide you refer to talks about back-to-back -back agreements. So, so that's where we're trying to, I suppose, find the full guy <laughs> in the supply chain. Um, make, make sure that everybody's covered so that uh, there's not somebody who, who's exposed to the potential liability should there be a, 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 you know, a claim from the consumer. Yes, absolutely. So what I tell my manufacturing type client is I say, look, you're going to have to have back-to-back -back agreements with the people who supply you because if a problem arises, you don't want to be the one left holding the hot potato. Yes, because, <laughs> absolutely. Because where the Consumer Protection Act gives the consumer a, a lot of rights in terms of being able to claim for damages, etc., without having to prove negligence, that is not the natural position between suppliers. So what happens yes. is that supplier who didn't, who didn't act negligently may not be able to claim against the person who supplied him who did act negligently, unless there's a contract in place that's got the right sort of provision. So, as I say, okay. life, everyone is trying to pass the potential liability under the exclusion of the supply chain. And you yes. need to yes. understand that starting, at, starting with the CPA, the retailer is liable under strict liability to the consumer for any harm caused, then simply wants to hand off that liability to the person who supplied them. Yes. And that's why you'll find that very often the retailer supplier often has to sign an indemnity to the retailer. And those things must be read very carefully because in a retail environment there's a lot of opportunities for mishandling, mis logistical problems, etc. Whereas the product yes. is fine at the time that it left the supplier. Yes. It's caused. it's caused by their product, but not to any anything they did or didn't do. Uh, a manufacturer may be required to indemnify the supplier or wholesaler against claims by a retailer as well. So you'll find that sometimes there are various agreements, each one wanting the same entity to indemnify different people. But the key thing here is you can never exclude consumer liability. So the consumer liability under the law, it's a consumer protection act. There is no way to exclude that. So, should a consumer be poisoned or suffer any sort of harm, a broken tooth, etc., they will have a claim against the supply chain. This contract simply arrange who in the supply chain will eventually be liable to pay the consumer. Okay, I understand. Uh, again, it, in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the requirement to make sure that you're reading the fine print, I think is absolutely essential. So, so now, as far as what may uh, be in the contract, uh, uh, as far as the requirements of the contract are concerned, the specific issues relating to the law and, and food safety and quality, what is reasonable to expect? Look, I think that you're going to find that it's reasonable to expect that there'll be provisions regarding legal compliance, that the product that you are supplying complies with the laws in terms of which it's regulated. And quite often, suppliers should be required to warrant that the products comply with the legal requirements, for example, the Act, ATX Act, and some other acts. And I don't have a problem with that. I think it's in any case, by law, you need to be compliant with those. But the yes, it's almost a moot point. Yeah, it is, except with one, with one difficulty, is that sometimes legal requirements change and the contracts don't change. So I want to just be careful there that one keeps the contracts updated 
after the legal requirements actually change. And then we've got that's the an interesting. Sorry, I said that's an interesting point because um, you know you would then ex you know if it's not renewed annually, then you would you may even expect to see a contract change between the twelve month cycle if if one of the regulations change. Yes, and what happens is some of these regulations have been coming into effect with six months and not even a year leading time, and. Uh, yes. So you do find that you then have to consider the impact on the supplier agreement. Absolutely. An issue, an issue which is coming up more, I suppose, in the popular press than anywhere else is this whole issue of expired stock. Now, this is a bit of a bugbear because what's been happening is retailers in general expect their suppliers to carry the risk of expired stock. So the yes. general principle, as far as I see it, is that the retailer, the, the manufacturer simply has to come and uplift expired stock and take it away and carry the loss. And yes, that seems to be that seems to be the current practice. It is a common practice, and I think that manufacturers and suppliers with the current economic climate and the price of food stuffs and so on possibly need to rethink all of that and say, look. You know, whose responsibility is it to rotate stock, to estimate stock, etc. We share that risk and not simply just accept the expired stock is their liability. Yes, no, I agree. Uh, I, I agree. I, I think it is definitely, you know, there's there's definitely more responsibility on the side of the retailer to manage the stock that they buy because, you know, they, they are doing that based on sales forecasts. There are replenishment reports. Um, and so that system should be monitored more closely. Um, in terms of the, um, if I have an agreement with this, the retailer and I know the law has changed, but the agreement was created by the retailer, should I initiate um, the discussion regarding having to update the contract or should I leave that for the party who initiated it? It would depend whether the changes benefit you or are against you. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I mean, I, seriously, no, I mean, if, if, if the situation... Yes, no, no, I understand. Sorry? So I, I, that makes sense. Yeah. No, if the, if the regulation changed and it now prejudices me, I will immediately go and say, look, we need to re renegotiate. It. But if it favors yes. me, I will leave it and let them wake up to it and come <laughs> to me. <laughs> and then the, <clears throat> the last point is... With regards to um, the, uh, you know, something like the APS, um, at this point in time, I know that that's a very contentious piece of legislation. Um, and the, you know, just because it's all of a sudden being enforced, um, whereas previously it wasn't enforced, that, that doesn't mean there's a change in a contract. It's still a, a requirement of the law. So the only thing that I think in terms of that particular point that you've just raised is that they when the assignees under the APS Act start billing people for their services, there's going to be a whole rash of renegotiation of these contracts because who's going to Absolutely. be so Absolutely. So, retailers want their suppliers to pay for it, but the inspections are being done at the retailer. Yes. So it's going to be quite tricky as to who pays for what and how do you apportion those costs. Yeah, absolutely. I, I look based on what I heard recently uh, attending a workshop with one of the assignees. Uh, the decision has been made that the inspections will be done at the facilities where they're manufactured. Um, so I think from that perspective, the the retailer may be may be resisting any additional you know costs because it will be done at the manufacturer, not at the distribution centres. But I think time will tell as uh, as these things are are, uh, are rolled out. What about quality and safety issues? Um, how do we address those in the contract? Well, I think this is almost the key of the whole contract is that one has to have product specifications which are clear and not left to be sorted out later. And you'll note I put in brackets never because absolutely the contract that have been in place for years where the yes. picture where the product specification was supposed to be laid out was never filled in. It says, yes. we are buying product so-and-so as per annexure B. It 
turn to Annex B and it's blank. Yes. You find it. Everybody signed it from both sides. So it's really critical because unless you know what the product certification is, how do you know that you're complying with the supply requirements? And how can a retailer reject the product as being non compliant if there was no product specification? So the product Absolutely. specifications define the quality and are critical to any supply agreement. And I'm quite amazed at how, how either they incomplete, insufficient, or simply missing in many cases. Yeah, in my in my experience, Janish, I find them as additional documents. So so that you know, sixteen page addendum six um, format, which is 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 being used most of the time now, that document is separate from the trade agreement. Um, and if I supply fifteen products, there will be fifteen of those, hopefully. But those are separate. And in, in my experience, I I've not seen them as a mentioned as an addendum to the trade agreement, which what, you know, if, if what you're saying is, it, based on what you're saying now, it should at least then be referenced as an addendum if it's not included within the body of the contract. No, absolutely. The fact that you've got a separate document which in no way references the supply agreement and the supply agreement doesn't reference that document, it would have no bearing on the interpretation of the supply agreement if there was ever a dispute. But you could suddenly find that some of the Protections that you thought you had built into the supply agreement don't come into play. So I think it's absolutely at the very least, I agree with you, you should reference it into the actual supply agreement. Yeah, Ab absolutely, absolutely. Okay, now uh, I, the, the food safety audits are obviously another hotly contested issue because of the cost and the disputes. Um, that should also be included in the agreement? At the very least, what should be included in the agreement is the fact that there will be such audits, uh, the, me the mechanism whereby they will be invoked, how many there will be, and of course, who has the liability for payment. Um, and you can have that the routine ones are paid for by one party, but ad hoc ones can be paid for by the defaulting party. So. If I, okay. to ask, I need to have another audit on you and then it turns out you passed that audit, then I must pay for it. You failed that okay. audit, then you must pay for it. So those types okay. of things. So you're not going to go into the detail of the audit as such, but simply into how, when, how often. Quite, quite, quite similar to the discussions that, we, that have been going around around the SINE situation. Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And, and then, of course, the, the, the caveat being that it's all for the consumer and so it's not unreasonable to, um, you know, specify that products have to be safe. No, absolutely. So the Consumer Protection Act, in any case, guarantees to the consumer that any product that they buy will be safe and of the law says good quality, let's just say sufficient quality. Yeah. Uh, yes. So can therefore, be the, the the company buying that could reject the product if they weren't, even if it wasn't in the contract. But of course, I think it's quite obvious that every contract should have provisions regarding that all the product supplied shall be safe and of good quality. Shall be safe, and absolutely. Now, what about recalls? Um, because this can obviously be quite expensive. Um, and and who's responsible for paying for the recall if, if there's a need for a recall? Yeah, it becomes quite complicated because we don't have a unitary recall system in South Africa. Uh, different suppliers have their own recall system, retailers have their own recall system. So therefore, it's important that in the contract, one, def one defines the product recall triggers and the protocol okay. to follow so that everybody's on the same page. You know, I may decide to recall a product because 10 people have complained it doesn't taste right, but yet it's perfectly safe and, and 999 other people haven't complained. Am I then yes. to order a recall and then hold you liable? even though you believe there's nothing wrong with the product. So yes. one does need to have clearly defined recall triggers and protocols in the, in the contract, which makes it very clear who pays for the recall and also who pays for the stock losses. Now yes. we are talking from very serious amounts of money. Absolutely. Um, there's also the issue of damage to brands and 
that damage can be either to the manufacturer or even to the retailer that's selling the product of a manufacturer. And obviously more so in the case of house brands, where the retailer is selling something made by manufacturer but bears the name of the retailer. Absolutely, yes, I understand. And then obviously one has to have a provision. Who takes overall responsibility for the retail? Who deals with the National Consumer Commission? Who deals with the press? Who handles claims from the public? So that we don't have a situation where each party is dealing with it on their own as if it was they were the only party involved and referring matters to the other one this statement is are contradictory and potentially mm. This is a very, very important uh, provision which needs to be in there. These provisions can be a few lines. We're not talking here about pages and pages, but it's got to be very clear. That yes. Yeah. First of all, is it the supplier or the other or the or the person receiving the product that's going to be responsible? And if so, at what level within the company? And then, although it probably doesn't fall under recall, there should be provision in the contract for insurance. Yes. It's very important that the insurance must cover recalls and must cover product liability. Product liability, yes. Absolutely. The recalls and th are those are two, quite important. Th sorry. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, those are two separate insurance products. They, you know, they, they may be combined under one, uh, but most companies will actually need both, they, you know, in, in terms of their insurance. And also the recall procedure would normally need to be um, vetted by the insurance company because they are normally involved in that process if there is a recall. Absolutely. And that all has to be defined in the agreement so it's clear that one company yes. cannot simply go and initiate the recall leaving the other one in breach of the insurance contract. Absolutely. 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 Well, okay. about insurance, it's very important to note that many indemnity clauses simply liability for something that has happened could leave you uninsured because your insurance, yes. insurance contract doesn't see a situation where you on your own suddenly decide that you are liable. So no, yes, ab absolutely. I mean, the insurance company could repudiate your claims. Yes, yes. No, no, this is a very, this is a very tricky section of insurance. So it, it has to be done, you know, with, with the, with the insurance company's input as well. Okay. And then, um, sort of your final words as far as, um, what to, you know, yeah, if you had to sum it up, the key takeaways. Sure. Well, I would like to say the warnings to those out there. First of all, a contract is legally binding. Understand it before you sign it. And that's very, very important. Then indemnifying in a contract may invalidate your insurance cover if you accept liability willy-nilly. Yes. So I've dealt with a situation where there was a recall. And in terms of the contract, the one party agreed that it was liable for anything which followed after it had supplied the product. Now, as it turned out, the insurance company dealt with the complaint and so on, but they could have actually repudiated on the basis that you, you're not liable in law. You're liable because you agreed to be liable. And therefore yes, you're not in yes, yes, yes. The indemnified party has little to lose. They could invoke recall clauses, product rejection, returns, etc. So the more yeah. one part indemnifies the other, the least it makes it the quote-unquote problem of the other party. Because as sure. soon as anything that they're unhappy with, they simply invoke the contract. They say, we're indemnified. Take your product away. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. I suppose finally, because I've seen this a few times, do not warrant things you know you don't comply with. But somewhere in the supply agreement will be a clause about all products supplied are GMO free. Meanwhile, you are buying maize on the open market, you're getting soy from Argentina. Yeah. No one's checking it at all. But but no. you're, you're guaranteeing it's all GMO free. Yes. And there are many such yeah. circumstances, so one has to be very careful. Yeah. Yeah. Don't warrant things you don't, don't comply with. I suppose I should extend this or don't know whether you comply with. Yes, yeah. It, it, rather check before you sign. Absolutely. 
Okay, no, that, uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, strong words, and I think if I had to um, sum it up, it would be uh, don't read the contract on your own, rather get legal advice before you sign anything. No, absolutely. I mean, it goes right down to buying a house and signing the bond at the bank, you know. There's a lot yes. of things in there which seem quite harmless at the time that you sign them, but when the correct situation, when they're not the correct, when the right situation comes around, those clauses can either be there to protect you or to beat you. Up. Absolutely. Thank you, Janish. I'm switching back to you. Um, we would like to thank you so much for your time and thank you very much for your advice. I, I think it uh, was very uh, eye-opening um, and uh, I'm even more worried than I was before. Um, we had this uh, presentation. So just a, a comment to everybody out there just to make sure that you, first of all, have a supply agreement uh, and secondly, make sure you read what you've signed for uh, because uh, the fine print and even the sort of main headings of the contract could be uh, very, very serious if you are faced with this liability situation. We'd like to invite anyone out there, if you have any queries, please won't you engage with us on our forum. Um, you're welcome to log your questions and uh, we will respond to those questions. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Janusz. We really appreciate your time um, and we look forward to the next episode, uh, which will be coming up in the beginning of September. Thank you very much. Have a good day, Janusz. Thank you very much, Linda. Bye-bye. To everybody out there, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.